you there, beloved saints. I want to thank you guys for the beautiful Mother's Day messages. I hope you all um, enjoyed that today. And for those of you whose mothers have gone on to be with the Lord, please know that you were on my heart and, and mine today. Um, and we're promised that we'll see our loved ones again. We're not as those without hope, and that is just priceless, the gift that God has given us. Um, and you know what, you guys that are that are moms, every day's Mother's Day. <laughs> it should be anyway. Uh, so I want to answer this. I, I've gotten some, I don't know, some pretty hostile responses lately, quoting these verses out of context. And although my heart feels it's not going to do those people any good, because I have, I think, four, three or four videos on this verse already. But they're a little ways back. Sometimes uh, you can't find them. Uh, so I'm going to answer this. And I'm going to answer another question. What does it mean, fear of the Lord? Like, and I'm going to give you what the Bible says it is, okay? It can be interpreted both ways. But basically, it's reverence, reverential fear. It means to understand and be in awe of God's power and faithfulness. But there's one verse that tells you exactly what it means when it says, fear the Lord. It'll tell you. And I'll, I'll give that verse to you. It's wonderful. Um, and one of the other verses was, um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I, I constantly point out that uh, it does not say work for your salvation. It says work it out. If I'm a teacher and I tell my student to work out the problem on the chalkboard, do you think I've already given him a problem to work out? Yeah. How's he going to work the problem out if he doesn't have the problem? You haven't given it to him. How are we going to work out salvation we don't possess? Again, it's not saying work for your salvation. It's saying work the salvation that God has given us outward. What does that mean? To make it manifest through our lives, okay? Uh, in addition, it's telling us to remain obedient to the simplicity of the gospel. Not just the gospel simplicity, but also in the instruction of Christian living. Again, nobody's saved because the other living is a Christian. But uh, I would be wrong and a little dishonest to not present that saved people, all the epistles to saved people, instruct them how they should live and what they should stay away from to avoid the traps of the enemy that can have us do things via deception or other method to destroy ourselves. Because the only thing he has now, remember he's he's been bound Jesus bound the strong man. Uh, he is limited. He can no longer deceive the nations in the sense that they don't realize there's a one true God creator and they're worshiping pagan idols, which are really demons. Um, uh, overtly, with you know, everyone has a choice at this point. Um, and uh, for those that respond to the light he's given them through creation and conscience, he will give them an answer. He will reveal himself uh, if we respond to what he has given us. Um, now, in addition to that, uh, I am not here to argue uh, against or for uh, God, any, meeny, miny, mo. you're saved, you're not. I'm not letting you believe. I'm not, I'm not going there, okay? I don't care what you believe. If you think that God picked you and then made you believe the gospel, that's fine. Or if you believe God asked everybody to believe in him and gave you the evidence and the evidence convinced you and you believed it, uh, which I don't think there's anything to boast in. That is the camp I'm in, but it doesn't matter to me because this video is about, and again, we, we are all one in Christ. Okay. If you differ from me on some of these things, I, I have to give leeway because I can't take the position that I'm right on all things. Some of these things have been debated and that's why there's so many uh, denominations have been debated for centuries. 
you know? So I think what's important is that we all trust the Lord and what he did on Calvary. Okay. We need to learn to band together and to be able to be brothers and sisters in Christ and have different perspectives, ideas, and so forth on these various doctrines without uh, attacking each other. All right. Otherwise we, we can't learn. We can't grow. We can't help each other. So I hope that you'll hear me. Now, uh, most of the time when people throw this at us, they're using it as a weapon as if we're not working our salvation out. It's like, why would you even think that? Because we're abiding in grace. Uh, that's what we're supposed to do because it's for him that worketh not, but believes. So we just believe God and Sadly, they're not doing the one thing. They're not obeying the one thing the Lord told them to do, which was to trust in him and what he did, not themselves, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's for him that worketh not, but believes on him, he justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Um, so they, they, they don't believe it. But I may be able to help someone that's struggling with it or has been confused by this. So uh, again, if a teacher asks you to work out a problem on the chalkboard, uh, and then doesn't give you the problem. You're like, what problem? I don't know. You don't have it, but you got to work it out. How would that make sense? I mean, really? Uh, and in a prior video, I used the same thing about the gym. I'm going to work out my upper body today. What, you don't have any arms. How are you going to work them out? How are you going to work out an upper body? I don't have any arms, but I'm going to go work my arms out. I'm going to go work out the leg muscles. I don't have any legs. Hey, how are you going to work out leg muscles you don't have? So it's the same thing here. You cannot work out your salvation with fear and trembling if you don't have it. But I know what verse Paul is talking about when he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's referring to the Psalms. And I'll give that to you. It's a messianic verse about kiss the son lest he be angry. I love it. Uh, and I will give it to you. Okay. So a lot of times Paul is just referencing or paraphrasing the Old Testament. And if you, you know, you can find these things as you're studying, you can look through them and go, hmm, that's familiar. And then type that section in me, hmm, and then I'll, I'll find it. Somehow you connect them, you know, uh, the Lord shows us to it, showed, shows it to us that way, or, uh, uh, we can have a brother, sister, share it with us and go, Hey, look at this. This coincides with this. I love that. And I love that we share these things with each other online. Um, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, studying his word. I think it's beautiful. So let's look at the verse here. Again, it's ridiculous to think it's saying work for your salvation after all the epistles that tell you it's not of works. It's not by works of righteousness. It's by God's grace. If it be of grace, it no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it's something you're earning, it can't be called grace because grace means it was not earned or deserved. It's it's based on the goodness of God and, and his uh, generosity and mercy, not based on you and your worthiness. And see, people still think they're going to heaven because they're worthy of it because they decided to be good kids now. Nobody's getting there because of that. And you get all this self-righteous stuff thrown at real believers constantly as if we don't believe in obedience. I, I said uh, the other night, you know, it, we're, we're just, it's just silly because if I tell you um, no, of course you shouldn't lie, steal, kill, commit adultery, but you not doing those things isn't saving you. That's works of the law. That's, that's not what saving you. You're offending one. You're guilty of all. You've already broken the law. You can't be saved by it. Even if you kept it perfectly from here on out and thought word and deed still wouldn't save you. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. So stop trusting in that and trust in your savior. And it, it, and they quote me saying she doesn't believe in obedience. She promotes sin. Nonsense. I promote trust in Jesus for salvation. Not saying uh, once you're born of God, don't ever grow up. Don't grow up. Don't mature. Don't add to your faith. Don't get better. Don't do any of that. It's ridiculous. And, and the analogy I gave, maybe it was poor, but I, I think it makes sense. If I tell you, if you want to own your own home, you must pay the mortgage. It's the one thing you have to do. You've got to pay that mortgage if you want to own or keep a home. And you go around telling everybody, Renee says, don't pay your light bill. Mm -hmm, she sure did. She told me, just pay the mortgage. No, I said, pay the mortgage to keep or own your house. You can't keep or own your house by paying the light bill. You should pay your light bill. 
But that is not going to help you get to own a home. To own a home, you need to pay your mortgage, okay? But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do that too. You should do both, okay? So it's the same thing here. You should be doing what God tells you to do, all right? Because you're his child. Uh, and you're an ambassador for Christ, and you can give a bad witness. There's consequences for it, et cetera, et cetera. Temporal, earthly ones. But eternal damnation is just not one of those consequences anymore because you've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus. To deny this is blaspheming him. It is trampling him underfoot and calling the blood of the covenant by which we were sanctified, which we were made holy and clean and righteous, an unholy thing, and done it despite unto the spirit of grace, just like Hebrews says. So, I want it to be clear on that. Now, I do believe in working out our own salvation. Let's look at Philippians 2. It says, if there be, uh, this is the very beginning of the chapter, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any vows and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So think more of other people than you do yourself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to follow his example, and the Holy Spirit will always lead us to do so. But the reason I'm so adamant about the, the gospel being clear is because it's the, the gospel is God's power unto salvation for all who believe. So if you hear it and go, I don't believe that, that's easy to believe, it. then you don't believe the gospel, okay? And there's no power, and that's why you're still struggling, or you're limiting the standards of the law, watering them way down to think you don't sin, not on purpose, I just stumble, I make mistakes. Okay, that's sin, okay? Even the sin we did not know we committed. Even the sin we didn't even know was a sin to commit. Still had to make a sacrifice for it, okay? So one sin keeps you out right? We all sin too bad. Can't be saved by the law because we're all sinners. That's why Jesus died for us. You get that? So when you deny it, you're not a believer and there's no power in a false gospel. And you must be born of God. You have to be born again, regenerated. So the Holy Spirit's in you, then he can show you these things. Then he begins that work. Okay. Then you can work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which I find ironic that you're worried about everybody else's salvation uh, being intact. And if, if you're using this verse like that at other people, I don't know how. Okay, I, I'm not here to judge people's salvation. That's true. I'm, I'm just concerned. If you think that's what that's saying, then you're trusting in you. And you need to get saved and work your own salvation out. Right? Because we're all working our own salvation out. We're manifesting the inner salvation God gave us and manifesting it outward to make it matured and, and make it productive. Okay? So, and uh, so he's our example. And it says, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's one, another verse that confirms the deity of Jesus. But made himself of no reputation. He was equal, equal with God and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. Now, if he was all just human and not God, what was made as a man? It's God manifest in the flesh. It says, if you do not believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. And they italicize he, I am he italicized because they think he's saying, he, no, he's not. The I am of the old covenant. All right. He's, he's God. You don't believe that he is divine. She'll die in your sins because only God can forgive sins and judge the world and be worthy of all the things that he has done. Okay. Uh, and it says, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, the harshest execution ever created by man. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him 
and given him a name which is above every name. And see, this gets confusing to people that don't understand that the Godhead is three yet one. So uh, it could say God raised him. And it can also say, Jesus can say, my father raises me or my father gives me power to raise me up again. And he can also say, I will raise me. I have power to raise it up again. You see, because uh, God is the father, God is the son, and God is the Holy Spirit. But they are one, one in essence. All right, let's see. Um, Wherefore God has highly exalted him, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, okay, because of this, because Jesus was equal with God, became as a servant, as a man, and died, not just died uh, for us, but died the death of a cross and was obedient to God in all things, even something that horrific. Because he's done that, you too should be obedient because we're followers of who? Jesus, right? So, wherefore, my beloved, does he call unsaved people his beloved no no saved people have to work out their own salvation the word there uh, implies ownership also own is another implication of ownership so working out your salvation with fear and trembling means work what you have been given outward all right work it out Make it manifest. Put it to work. All right. As you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So let God do what he desires to do with you. Have his will direct your paths, okay? Just turn yourself over to the Lord, listen to his spirit, and work it out, all right? So, do unsaved people have God in them working his pleasure? No, but he can, of course, use anyone, saved or lost. But this is very specific, working in us, okay? So, uh, do all things without murmurings and disputing that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God. We're children of God or sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. So these are saved people. Again, beloved. Uh, I mean, I don't think I have to make that point anymore. Without rebuke. See, if you just hear his voice and do as he prompts us, there'll be no rebuke. There'll be no reason for God to correct you or the church or anyone, not even yourself, right? In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Okay, Paul's talking about the work he's done to bring these people to Christ, preaching the gospel to people that he's done well, you know, he boasts in them like his kids, you know, um, he cares very much for them. So with that being said, we can see the context. Let's look at this here. I want to show you what the Bible says. Cause a lot of people think fear means that God's going to beat you up and he's going to torture you. That's not what it means here about me having fear. Let me tell you what it actually is. It is strong confidence. Did you hear me? Fear the Lord. Oh, I can hear it now. No, you should be scared of God. Yeah, of course you should. It's reverential fear to his children, though. We're not under his wrath. Why would we fear him in the sense that he's going to hurt us? That's not what's going on here. This is about you shouldn't care what man thinks. Care what God thinks. Strong confidence in God. And when he tells you don't do something, you know it's for the best. You know it's good for you. You know if he's forbidding you from something. Is to prevent something damaging to you. Have strong confidence in God that his commandments, the things he tells us to do, they're to prevent more pain to us and to other people he loves. Okay? So, uh, 
it tells us exactly that. Because I didn't make it up, folks, because I'm already hearing it. All right, it's in uh, uh, Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And his children shall have a place of refuge. So when you fear God, you are confident that you are safe in him. Okay? So to have trust in God, to believe the way he directs you is right and you agree with that, to know that God could, he could do whatever he wants, but he, he loves you and he came and did that for you. Sent his son to die on the, he left, Jesus left heaven and came as a man and died that death so you could have everlasting life. This is the least we could do. You know, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But let me show you. Fear and trembling is is a heaviness. It's, there's a, a weight of heaviness and reverence. How many times do you see people, woe is me, uh, uh, I'm a dead man, whenever they're standing in the presence of God. That's fear and trembling. It's like, ah, like we have a concept of how holy he is and how, how lifted up and how perfect and powerful he is. But not really, you know. But we have an idea that even our own understanding, the fear and trembling we have at the thought of him is nowhere near what we're going to feel that day in his presence. All glorious day. Right. But I mean, even people like John who walked with Jesus in his earthly ministry fell as dead on his face, you know, in his presence, in all of his glory. So uh, it is not a negative thing. Fear and trembling is the, under the weight, the heaviness of his holiness and power. It's an awe and reverence, okay, especially as his children. So, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Uh, and Psalms 111, this is famous, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, when you understand that it's God you need to care about, uh, that you should worry about what he thinks, because he's the one that's going to judge you, right? Not man, that's the beginning of wisdom. Because you can hear his voice above all others. And he'll always lead you in the ways of righteousness and life for his name's sake. Okay. Um, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. So we understand when we do what God asks us to, it's for our own good and for the good of the world, our community in general. Uh, so. Let's, because uh, there's too many places in scripture to tell us, fear not, fear not, fear not. So now he's telling us to be scared of God. I, it Now, there's a healthy fear, like a child should have a healthy fear of their dad. I'm going to tell your dad, no, don't tell my dad. See, healthy fear. But they love their daddy. And the minute they walk in, daddy, and you run up to him and wrap your arms around his neck. I used to grab my dad's leg and he would have to walk around with me hanging on his foot. I remember that. But, um. You know, you didn't want daddy mad. You love your dad and you don't want to do anything to hurt him. And you don't want him disappointed either. Uh, so it's not a fear like he's going to hurt you or he's going to punish you. What comes with it as a disobedient child is correction, is corrective teaching. Chastisement is corrective teaching. Like David says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, not they beat me. He doesn't go beating the sheep. He taps on each side to keep you on the right path. Oh, don't go over here. That's painful. Ah, we're not going that way. Tap, tap, tap. Wrong, wrong way. See, they comfort me because I know if I'm getting that, uh, I shouldn't be going over there, right? It's a comfort. It's not to beat you up. All right. So let's look at the verse that clearly tells us what fear and trembling is and how to work it out. How do we work out? our own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, it tells us in Psalms 2, it is to serve and rejoice. That's how you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You work out the salvation God has given you, make it manifest and productive in God's service and service of the community and so forth and service of the church. You work it out by serving and rejoicing because it tells us here, serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. So do you see here where he's telling people to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling? 
and to be obedient, not just in, in when he's present, but also in his absence, because it's God's uh, pleasure to do what he wills in each one of us. And if Jesus was obedient, even to the death on the cross, and we are following his example, the Holy Spirit will always lead us right. And we should be doing that. Um, so serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, S-O-N, capital S, kiss the sun. Remember, this is Old Testament. It's a messianic prophecy. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they, all they, that put their trust in him. Who? The sun. What a beautiful messianic prophecy. Now, this is the Psalms. David is, is, is considered the one that wrote most of the Psalms. Um, but we didn't write all of them, but uh, this is Holy Spirit inspired. This is before the Son of God was even manifest. Just amazing. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So if you want to know how to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you want to serve and rejoice. And uh, fear, the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom and is to have strong confidence in what God's guidance is, that you agree with it, you know it's for the best, and you're going to you're gonna listen and you're going to go that way, okay? So I hope it helped you. Um, I already know there's a lot of people, they're not going to hear it. They're not going to hear it, but I get letters every now and then, and let me just say, Thank you, because it does get it heartbreaking sometimes to feel like nobody's understanding me. Um, am I speaking? Hello, is this thing on? You know, because I, I, I seem to like, what? Where are you getting this? I've been on here for years and the same people come back year after year with the same verses. And I'm like, but I answered that for you. I put to you on there and then showed you what it, never mind. I can't, I can't help some people that don't want to believe it. But God uses it for good, you see, because there's some people that are on the fence and they don't understand and it helps them and they'll write back and go, I was so mad at you. I used to think you were this easy believism teacher, blah, blah, blah. But you kept saying the law is going to make you guilty. You're going to come to the end of yourself. And they would hear my big mouth in their head going, you look at a woman, you feel that you think it's thought of foolishness to do good and to do to need to do good or to know to do good. Do, do it not. It's it's sin to you to to do something without faith. It's sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So uh, worry, all of it, gossip. It's just so many ways we fall short of the glory of God. So that's why we don't look at us. We'd have no joy. We'd go crazy. And the only way to avoid that is one, get saved, keep your eyes on Jesus and grow knowing that you're already saved and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God is he knows what's best and he has saved you and he's so powerful and we have to answer for him, answer to him for what we're equipped. We have the Holy Spirit. We can hear his voice. We know we have the written word of God. We know what's right and wrong. And, uh, but we're not supposed to walk around with the dead letter hanging over us, uh, judging us at every turn. That's not being held against us. It doesn't mean just because of that, there's no consequence. There is. And if you're a Christian and you murder someone, you better believe there's going to be consequence. God's not going to let you get away with that as a Christian. I don't, I, I, I don't know why you do that, but like David, he tried to cover up his adultery by killing Uriah, very, one of his best friends. So, And he was blind to his own sin. He was furious when the prophet told him the story of the man who had taken that, that poor man's lamb and he had a whole uh, a bunch of sheep. And he took that one lamb and he loved that lamb and he took it and slaughtered it and fed it. Who is this man? I'll execute him. He said, it's you, David. It's you. He was devastated. He was blind to it. See, so sometimes people are blind to their own sin. So I pray and I thank you guys that write me back and go, yeah, you just wouldn't shut up and mad. I started thinking about all the little ways I felt God. And I was like, I am not as righteous as I think I am. And I started to feel de depressed and, and just desperate. Good. 
The law is doing its job. It's to, to stop every mouth and make the whole world guilty. Good. Now, come to the Lord. That's what we all need to do. Then you can be relieved. Remember in the song Amazing Grace, it's grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears, relieved. God puts that fear in your heart so that you come to the Lord. You know you got an answer for this. And you need a Savior. And then when you come to the Lord, the fears are relieved. Grace now heals you and restores you and tells you you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that nothing will snatch you out of his hand. Nothing, no one. Paul says, Nothing, nothing now, nothing present, nothing in the future can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. And Jesus tells the Holy Spirit will abide with us forever and that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. God doesn't promise and break it. Okay. So, um, you guys, I hope this helps and, um, I look forward to seeing you guys soon. God bless you. Good night.